What is good, everyone? Welcome to the Exhaust Notes Formula One podcast. My name is Nick. I'm with my guys, Roa and Todd, to talk about some racing news that we just uh, felt we needed to share with you before this next race. So before we get into it, though, what's good, fellas? How you guys been? Trying to find poutine to eat before we commemorate this race in Montreal. Like, I know Montreal is a big food city. What else is there that Montreal is known for? I think poutine and bagels. <laughs> And dunks, apparently. Uh, I just had a, some really good Korean poutine. It was very strange. Ooh, do tell. Yeah, that it sounds was pretty like, good. It was like poutine with uh, some sort of cheese, which I am not a good foodie in that way to spout off the exact name. But the uh, sauce, like the gravy, was like gochujang-based is that how you pronounce it? Because we had a work lunch today and gochukong sauce was there. And I was like, I am not even trying to get fired, even attempting to say this name. So I just called it G sauce. <laughs> <laughs> That's a much different thing. Uh, no, I have an Asian wife and she's she's learned me in the ways. So uh, apparently it's gochujang. Gochujang. I think. That's uh, anyway. See, I figured out my Guan Yu Zhou of the year. So thank you for that. <laughs> This time next year, you're going to be well-versed in Korean food. Exactly. It's a, a good uh, I, I, a good tie-in. I actually had gochujang-flavored noodles for lunch yesterday. It's one of my – It's one of, like, I'll have to take a picture of it. We have like a mini shelf or mini cupboard in this new place that we moved into that's like not big enough to really put anything normal in. So I just made it my ramen no- or my, you know – Instant noodles storage. So got a good variety in there. That's definitely one of the go-tos for me. I love those little random nooks and crannies in old houses. Yep, definitely. All right, guys. So in order to kind of officially reiterate and announce that we are now putting the podcast on YouTube, I wanted to share something that I actually hinted at last season before we get into all the news and stuff of today, because One, I need anybody that's listening to this on the podcast to go over to YouTube and, of course, subscribe, hit the links, tap the little bell, whatever the YouTuber saying is. Yeah. Um, Also, I love that, like all YouTubers say the 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 bell button up here or right here or down here, and it's never in the place they click it. So click the button somewhere on the screen here um, and hit subscribe for us. But. My my other announcement, we don't talk about the other pods too much on this show, but I have a podcast called The Crown and Stitch. We talk about hats. We also have the Sneaker History Podcast where Rohit and I and Robbie and Mike talk about sneakers. All this is in like Discord community. If you're in the Discord, you know about it. But I kind of got a combination here that I need to just unpackage for you guys. So this is the official first unboxing on the Exhaust Notes channel. Hey. Oh. <laughs> Official oh, merchandise. The Haas Rich Wind Energy. Rich energy. Let, let's not bury the lead. Yeah, Rich Energy Snapback. Oh, I need one of those. So I, I grabbed this like last year when we started the pod because it was on eBay. And I'm like, I've never seen that before available. I mean, when it was happening, it was available, obviously, but it was like probably 80. Actually, uh,. Oh, there's no price on it. But, you know, F1 merchandise, they always do the uh, insanely overpriced stuff. So this a cheap little snapback hat was probably 80 or 90 dollars or something back then. But uh, it was it was one of the episodes where we were talking about rich energy and, and the chaos and fiasco of that era for Haas. And I was like, wow, this is actually officially merchant officially licensed merchandise because there's a lot of bootleg stuff to get T-shirts on eBay. And I've never pulled the trigger on one because I'm like, I just don't even trust that any of these are going to show up real. And like, if it's just a printed shirt, I'll just print my own shirt, you know. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, had to get a had to get a Haas F1 team hat just for the uh, just for the show, you know. It's, yeah. And we're back. Welcome <laughs> to the Exhaust Notes podcast, <laughs> the one stop shop for all things pop culture, Formula One, and the spanner in between. <laughs> I've got terrific Todd Yates. I've got the knight himself, Nick Engvall. What's going on, fellas? Just talking a little F1 merch. 
think, that's yeah, amazing. Saw, that's a I great think might need to be yeah. might need to be our, our intro man now. Yeah. <laughs> no, zoom, zoom, I mean, zoom. I'm, Tonight. Zoom, zoom, zoom. Just turn it into a strip club DJ character. Hey, coming up next on the stage, we have Todd Yates <laughs> with Formula One direction and what grinds his gears. <laughs> Give it away, Todd. Don't forget to tip your waiters and waitresses. Yes. Oh, my God. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. I mean, so, yeah. guys, I, I have to ask a question, though. How often buy Formula One merch? Is it a seasonal thing or is it just like, hey, you rock with the same team? I got it last year. It's funny you mention that, because when I first got into Formula One, I bought one T-shirt and I realized how hilariously overpriced they were. And as is a common theme motif, I don't know what you want to call it. Uh, I lied to my wife about how expensive it was and <laughs> subtracted dare I say $40 from the price. And you know what? Esteban Ocon will all forever be a Renault driver for me, <laughs> according to this shirt. And it's also one of those things. Can't really wear it to work. And I live in Beaverton. So, I mean, if people see me wearing a, was it a Lecoque Sportif t-shirt, I'm sure I'm going to be on someone's shit list. So really the joke's on me. <laughs> I didn't even think about that part of it, but yeah. How about you, Todd? Do you? I think you're a little bit more of a serial buyer of things. I was for a while, but then I started to feel like you know, same, same. Like the last thing I bought, which I was super disappointed in, was the McLaren team jersey, the Danny Rick one. When they first switched themes from that, like kind of more bright blue to like the orange and more black. So I bought one of those and I was like, oh, that's cool. I want a, a Danny Rick jersey, but it's more of like a jersey. It's thin, like, I mean, nylon thin and it was $90. And I was so put off by the quality of it that I was like, I'm not, I'm not going to buy officially licensed stuff anymore unless it's like super dope. And I've also changed up to where like you just showed us that amazing rich energy Haas hat. Like if a team comes out with just something dope looking, I'm in for it. Yep. Like if w Williams does, uh, w Williams has uh, a pretty cool like theme this year with their driver yeah. suits and stuff with the golf logos and the Duracell and whatnot. So if they come out with something cool for that, like I would totally get an Albon t-shirt. I have to be a fan of the driver also though. That's like a rule. Even so if Red Bull came any, out with There won't super. be any Stroll or Latifi shirts or jerseys in your life anytime soon. Yeah. It's Max also. Like I, I <laughs> might get like a Checo something or other Red Bull. But yeah. it's gotta be super like Mexican themed. Like I want a Red Bull jersey in Mexican flag colors. That has, the, uh, those or something like, like that. Celebrate yeah, the dude, dope, right? Yeah. That's my birthday. I would totally do. Uh, totally do that. How about you, Nick? Do you are you? Yeah, I was you're more say, of an like, obscure F1 uh, merch buyer. Yeah, like so. If you don't really know me, I approach most things in life in like the opposite way that all the trends go for some reason. Where it's like, oh, nobody likes this shoe anymore. That's the shoe I'm going to be obsessed over. Oh, this shoe is or this. T-shirt or hat is 10 years old and most people won't recognize it. That's the one for me. So Formula One stuff has become that way, too, because. One, like, you know, the, there's so many, so many people ch changing teams at all times and the, and the colors of the teams change so much. that It's not like other than Red Bull and Ferrari. It's not like you can buy something and really feel like oh, I'm still supporting the same team. Next year, next year, next year, right? We know Red Bull's going to have basically the same car livery wise. Ferrari's always going to have primarily red. And I'm, you know, generalizing. They also, they obviously change it a little bit. But to me, those are the only ones that really stand the test of time. And I'm not necessarily, I'm not a hater of either of those teams, to, but like, I'm just not like a supporter of either of those teams either. So I kind of default to let me just go after like older, obscure stuff and, you know, wait for things to go on clearance and be like, oh, that's a that's a that's a conversation starter. Right. If if I'm at a if I'm at Laguna Seca, some some race or something and I'm wearing like a Haas F1 team with a with rich energy sponsor, somebody's going to ask me about it because it's like who would who would wear this like, you know, stained sponsor of Formula One, you know, 
Haas, but that's exactly why I'd wear it is because somebody would be like, oh, man, that's crazy. What's up with that? So so, so two follow-up questions for you, Mr. Engvall. One, Todd kind of shared his drivers he will not buy any merchandise of in the current grid. Do you have, let's say, two to three that are in a similar status for you? And then what has been your best Formula One apparel or item encounter out in the wild with somebody you don't know? Uh... So I don't I don't think I really have drivers that I would just 100% say I'd never buy that driver. Um because even the you know like at times like I wouldn't have bought Seb stuff. Right now I wouldn't be buying Max stuff, but 5 10 years from now I'll probably get some sort of Max thing cuz it's like I still admire these guys regardless of who I'm cheering for every week or every race. Um it's funny like I haven't I can't think of anything right off the top of my head in terms of people like coming up to me recently, but I'll, I'll, I'll use this to kind of talk about this hat that I'm wearing. Right. It's basically a Mets colored giants hat. And like, I didn't really think much of it other than like, I obviously know the history of the team. You know, my grandparents were giants fans when they moved the giants from New York to, to San Francisco in the fifties, the Mets were the team that replaced the giants in New York. I, the only baseball jersey that I have outside of Giants jerseys is a Mets jersey because Willie Mays played for the Mets. My brother was a big Daryl Strawberry fan, so I was like, eh, it's colors I like anyway. I'm just going to get the hat. I've had it for like maybe two weeks now, three weeks, however long I've been wearing it. And I've had three people in Monterey like basically say, oh, I like that hat. That's such a great story for that hat. And I'm like wow, people actually know that like there's a connection to the Mets with the Giants, like, but like you wouldn't think that, right? So those are the things that like I'm looking forward to on the on the racing side. Um, maybe too deep, deep cut from a lot of people that are into Formula One, but the bar Honda teams, um, whenever that was, 03-ish, uh, Jensen Button, Takuma Sato, that era, right? Uh, they actually, the, it wasn't one of those drivers, but the back, I forget the backup driver. They actually set the Bonneville speed flat, Bonneville salt flats, land speed record in the formula one car back then. And about six or nine months ago, I came across it on eBay, some random person in, you know, wherever it is, it's a Utah, right? like basically selling a bunch of this leftover merch. And I, I, I can't remember if Aaron saw it first or if I saw it first and we like text each other. Cause obviously we were both huge bar Honda fans. That was like kind of our, that was probably the peak of my formula one fandom it was like, I was really into it. Cause I was also really into, I am really into Hondas and they were actually like an exciting team for us. So uh, that was a cool moment. And I'm definitely looking forward to like an actual exchange because that's one of those weird crossovers of like, if you care about Bonneville, you're probably not a Formula One fan. But if you see a shirt that says Bonneville and Formula One on the same thing, you're probably like, if you know about it, I need to be your friend. Yeah. If you don't, you're probably going to be like, what the hell is that? And I'll be like, I got a story for you. You know, <laughs> come you listen just to our become podcast. My new best friend for the pet next fifteen <laughs> minutes. You did <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Exactly. Yep. Perfect. But anyway, speaking of uh, drivers with contracts ending this year and uh, merch that we'll be buying next year on clearance, <laughs> who do we got? <laughs> I, I've got a, one to kick this off, but there's there was a big article on F1.com, and I think that's where we, where we were talking about earlier. But our boy, Nicholas, or it's not even Nicholas, it's just Nick with an, a Y. Does that bother you when you have, you see Nick spelt weird ways, Nick? Senior Nick uh, correspondent is fairly apathetic <laughs> towards this development. Yeah, he didn't, didn't care at all. I don't want to speak on behalf of all Nicholases or Nicks. Nikolai. I personally am a Nicholas. I, I've definitely been a Nikolai for a lot of people in my life, so um, it doesn't really bother me. I just think the use of a Y... You know, it's it's like if we decided to call exhaust notes with a Z, exhaust notes. Oh, I thought you were going to put the Z in notes. 
In both. <laughs> oh, fair enough. <laughs> yep. Uh, so anyway, our boy Nick DeVries is, you know, according to the F1 media, pretty pretty well onto being in the hot seat. Uh, even after how how many races have we had? Seven. We're calendared seven. for eight, seven races. Yep. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just want to go over some of his stats, and I think I want to get your hot takes on whether or not he needs to be cut mid-season, into the season, and then we'll talk about you know potential driver offings. So sure. average pace, his average finishing position, Sonoda's at 10.6. He's at 15.3. Okay. Uh, in qualifying trim, he's three tenths off of him in the same car. Mm. And all that being said, there's only two points separating them. So Yuki has two points. DeVries has zero. Do you guys think, because Red Bull, we know, has been probably the pioneers of mid-season driver replacements, Swapping up and down. We had it with, let's see, Kivyet. Then Daniil Kivyet went up. Then he got replaced by Pierre Gasly. Oh, wait, no. Albon was after Kivyet. Then. Then Gasly. I thought right? Albon replaced Gasly in the main team. Oh, yep. Yeah, you're right. You're right. I swapped that. So it was Kivyet, uh, uh, Gasly. Albon, and then we finally have stability with Checo. But, like, he's – we've talked about it before on the podcast. Like, he's kind of shitting the bed. Even though the car is an absolute dog, he's not doing doing well in any form. And he's making Yuki, who's, like, still having kind of an up-and-down season, look really good in this case. So what do you guys think? Would you helmet Marco the dude and just – Swap men for. Uh, I'm sure Red Bull has some drivers in the wings that have enough yeah, they points. They always have drivers in the wings because Red Bull always gives you wings if we're leading to be believed by their tagline. I will say this anytime there's this notion of replacing somebody, whether it's a sport, whether it's a player, whether it's a coach, my natural question is who are you going to replace them with? Because if they bring up somebody, are we really going to see someone have all that much more difference in how they race compared to what? Nick DeVries is doing because to your point, it's still a dog shit of a car. And if somebody can get points out of that car, then I maintain they've got greener pastures and their time at Alpha Tauri is a short one at best. Yeah, I think that's a great point. I think also like we're kind of in a, I don't know that we've seen enough with upgrades this year, right? Like people, not to say that it's going to help either of those guys, to be honest, but I feel like they're still going to wait a little bit like with what 20, what do we have? 22 races this year. Yep. I'm getting 22, 23. Well, I think one got canceled. So yeah, down to yeah, 22, yeah. but like, you know, we're only a third of the way through the season. It seems like it's, it seems like we're half, it's half over because max is basically a couple wins away from his championship. But like, you know, I think that most of the teams are probably going to be, they're not going to be even Red Bull, who's aggressive with those changes, probably not going to make any changes for a few more races. Right. They, they kind of want to see how how these guys play out with upgrades and also just like, you know, who knows? Maybe there's track differences that ju- that can justify it. But I do think both those guys are definitely on the hot seat, you know, like a month, a month, a month or two from now. I wouldn't be surprised if we're seeing a whole new, you know, lineup for for Alpha Tori because. To Rhodes' point, like if you do it in the middle of the season, you know at least at least you're setting yourself up for next season to give these guys seat time in an actual Formula One car, right? As much as like we talk about, you know, the progression from you know cars to F three to F two to F one, like it's just like any car, right? You don't really know how to drive that car until you get behind the wheel. Max is a great example of that, right? Like the more he's been in that Red Bull car, the more comfortable he gets with it, both on a season level, but on a career level, the further away he gets. And I think that's kind of what what I would expect from, from whoever comes in next. Like, 
Red Bulls, like Alpha Tori is, is going to, they're going to, you know, hope that that next person starts to shine a little bit sooner and they can say, okay, cool. Next season, this is, we're back in the, you know, back, back in the midfield, right? Like they're absolutely what only Williams is lower, lower than them at this, at this point. Right. I think Haas has even been scoring points more frequently than them. So, you know, not really any denying they're kind of at the bottom of the barrel right now. So, but all that being said, Nick DeVries keeps performing like this and Yuki keeps being on the fringes of the points, which is where he, you know, that's overperforming for where the car is. Right. Um, we get to the summer break. Do you make a change then? Be, like you just said, trying to get somebody potentially in the Red Bull camp up a seat, see how they do it. They've got another half a season yeah. of just basically practice races, right? Like it doesn't matter. There's no pressure. Just like, can you hang? Can you at least keep pace with Yuki-san? Yeah. I mean, my, my maybe my hot take on that whole thing would be like, if, if Yuki isn't scoring multiple points, if he doesn't have multiple races with points in the next, what do we have? Four races to get to summer break, maybe three. If he's not scoring points in, in multiple races and if DeVries isn't scoring points at all, I wouldn't be surprised if both of them are out mid season. Do you really think they would get rid of both drivers? That would be drastic. I, I, no, but I mean, I, the reason why I tend to agree with Nick is the interest in that team has just driven off a cliff to borrow a bad pun because previously it was very much looked at as a feeder system, but especially in recent years, it just seems to be like uh, this more burden than anything else, because I do think the talent pipeline has dried up. And it's funny. We mentioned the instability at Red Bull because what caused that instability was Daniel Ricardo not signing. And I truly wonder how much longer Daniel Ricardo would have had at Red Bull and how much longer would he have delayed this inevitable carousel of drivers coming in and out? Because by just doing that, that's our sliding door, doors moment. And Red Bull previously had this reputation of being a bit cutthroat. But by Ricardo leaving and them ushering in this new shit show of an era, that took it to a next level. I mean, and I, I think that I think it's it's more of a. I think we're like we talk about drivers all the time, but like, where's the like crew pipeline? Where's the mechanics pipeline? The fact that you have. Like AlphaTauri and Red Bull are very stubborn about like admitting that the car is trash, right? They are probably going to react harshly and replace both drivers. You know, I'm not saying that it's likely. I think that that it's a good possibility, but I think one driver is probably out, almost guaranteed by summer break ish, close to that. But like the car itself needs to improve drastically. To your point, Todd, and I think like th that's you know that based on looking at Pierre Gasly, right? Like he's in an Alpine car is obviously, you know much better than, than Alpha Tori, but he's still in like ninth or 10th in the standings. Like that's impressive for moving into that car. That was not necessarily at that level of competition last year, in my opinion, like, you know, close, but like, I wouldn't have expected if, if you would have told me to pin where Gasly would be at this point in the season, I would put him, you know, 12th, 13th, 14th, at least a handful of places lower than where he's at, which to me suggests that, it's really more of a, like, where's the team that can provide for these drivers? Because obviously, to your point, like, or to both of your points about, like, what we've seen with Red Bull in the past, right? Like, they obviously have a crazy high standard, highest standard of any of the teams on the grid, in my opinion, right? That's why they win. But at the same time, like, they've, they've shown that, like, a lot of these drivers, like are almost like better in seats that aren't right quite as like cutthroat, right? You have to have the right mentality to race for Red Bull and to win right now. I think that's kind of an interesting conundrum that they have because the Alpha Tori team is like, it just doesn't seem like there's any desire to compete on that team right now. Right. And I know that's generalizing and, and you know, I don't mean to like put them down in that way, but it's miss they're just missing the mark by so much as a as a team, regardless of the drivers that are in the car. But I don't think that they're willing to look in the mirror and say that about their team. I'm I am a bit shocked for you being a Yuki fanboy to hear you speak ill of Yuki in that sense, because like when I look at 
averaging finishing position for Yuki, who's in what we believe to be the ninth or tenth slowest, you know, or ninth or tenth fastest car, whatever, either last or dead last. And to hit, for him to have a finishing position of 10.6, like he's nipping on the points on average every race. So, and I mean, I know that got skewed a little bit with, I think he got a, what was it, a PA? No, I mean, had, he only has two points though, right? So, yeah, it'd be a P9. I yeah. think he just got the points one race, but averaging posi- finishing position for the rest of the race is right off the points. I think his seat is safe for the year if he continues that. Nick DeVries, uh, yeah, I can see him being replaced, especially if they either one want to give an F2 driver a shot or my boy, Danny Rick. I don't think he would do it. Yeah, but- um the thing I'll push back at you about, Todd, is for the last couple of years, we've heard about this rising storm in Formula 2 where there always seems to be at least one to two drivers that are just taking Formula 2 by storm and they're going to come up to Formula 1 as a question of when and not if. My Formula 2 knowledge is completely non-existent. Is there a driver right now that fits that narrative of young hotshot that's about to set Formula 1 ablaze if and when he makes the transition up? Well, before that's... you answer that, before you answer that, I do hope that Yuki starts to land in the points. I, I I would love nothing more than to see Yuki get, you know, seven eights on a regular basis. But I think I think we see it in his frustration level with the team, right? Like, like we, you know, what we need, we need a graphics designer person to create us a little like like Yuki meter that's like how hot headed is Yuki during an episode? Because <laughs> like that to me says a lot about the team, right? Like it doesn't seem like he's just arguing, you know, he's just fighting for this, just to fight for it. He's obviously passionate and frustrated with the car itself. So, okay. Sorry. I didn't mean, I just want to throw that out there before we went on a different direction. No fair. Yeah. Uh, I'll fire back at your Yuki with some more Yuki first though. Um, it, you can tell he's <laughs> still classic Yuki and very passionate because he's the, the, the race last time it, when they told him to like pick up the pace or, I don't know what it was, something about braking in, in certain corners. And he screamed, like, do you want me to crash? Which I thought was the funniest, um, very Kimmy-like in his his response. But um, to respond to, to Ro, uh, it's not necessarily about who's the hot shot in, in F2. Red Bull very rarely goes outside of their own pool, which is why they have like 30 sponsored drivers at a time across – F2, F3, you know, other, the, the Asian formula racing and whatever. Um, but they do have Liam Lawson, which is decent in F2. He's got some race wins. He's not anywhere um, near winning the championship. But I think he would be like a decent person to try out if they wanted to, to go that route. And how old is Lawson? Because, I mean, I think that's the other thing that is probably – whether somebody wants to call it unfair or fair, a mark against DeVries, as I somehow accidentally turned my light off, is the fact that DeVries is relatively old to make his Formula One debut, no? What's Oh, yeah. So he won F2 like eight years ago and then was a reserve driver for a couple of years, then got picked up by Mercedes to drive for them in Formula E won the championship, raced in that series for a few years. And then he filled back in last year with that one race when Albon had his appendix explode, whatever. Um, We know the the history from there. But he was like 28, I think, when he made his Formula One debut. DeVries is early 20s, I want to say. Oh, you mean Lawson? Oh, sorry. Lawson, yes. Lawson is like early 20s. I mean, I think it's going to be interesting because what can we say about the Salvatore team that we haven't already beaten to death in terms of it's a dog shit car. They were once a promising place for drivers that were on the come up. And I think I say this through gritted teeth. I don't know if what you consider Yuki having this year is a up and coming driver. But if he looks better than the other guy and it's by a noticeable margin, I'm not even going to say it's a sizable margin, then I think it's fait accompli. But we'll see. So that 
uh, all that about DeVries, who do we think is going to lose their seats at the end of the year? I think, Ro, you have some stats on who's up. So who we have up in no particular order as I am vamping for time. First of all, both Mercedes drivers are end of contract at the end of this year. So that'll be interesting. I think both are going to be signed in in the case of Mr. Hamilton. That is a question of in the next couple of days, if not the next couple of weeks at the latest. Then we move on to the aforementioned Yuki Sonoda, who's also out of contract at the end of 23. Zhou Guan Yu is another one, as is Alex Albon. And then the one that was kind of interesting to me was, or two, one was Logan Sargent, as was Kevin Magnuson. So guys, we've got a couple different drivers there. Who's most likely to stay? Who's most likely to go? And then for a person that you think is gone, give me a name. I'll start us off. I am very intrigued by the fact that Kevin Magnuson only had, what, a two-year comeback, so to speak, on the cards? I think he's done more than enough to justify at least another two years because as Haas has been making progression in terms of being an average to, dare I say, a good car, it's seemingly tied to the return of Kevin Magnuson. And the only thing I think that could shut this trajectory down is somehow if they decide to go to the well one too many times and bring back the Phoenix himself, Romain Grosjean. What do you guys think? I mean, I don't think, I don't think Grosjean's coming back to Formula One anytime soon. He's, I think he seems to be enjoying IndyCar. But uh, I, I, the thing that I think about Haas is they have a lot of potential to turn around and have like a, a big, a big name player join the team, right? Like we kind of alluded to it last season with like Danny Rick. If Danny Rick drives for Haas, his stock goes way up in America, right? He's already top tier. Formula One driver in America, fan base wise. But if Haas's car is as good as it seems to be getting, and like Gunther was talking about it again this week, like how much they were they were excited, the progression that they've made. You know, I think the interesting thing about that is like it, at the end of last season, there was very few people we would even think would, would potentially take the risk of going to Haas. At the end of this season, the interest in drivers f- wanting to go to Haas is going to be way higher than it has been in years. So to me, that's a really kind of caveat to whatever that seat looks like. And and I like Magnuson, but, you know, like, let's say, let's say Danny Rick or... You know, I doubt that like George would leave Mercedes for any reason at all. But like one of those guys has a good conversation or two with Gunther and you might have a, a like you might have a heavy hitter in, in, driving for Haas next season. And it, it's really nothing against Magnuson. It's just that the contract is up and they're going to explore their options, in my opinion. I think that's a that's a good call. Like every team always explores their options. Like we we heard. Ferrari tried to get Christian Horner by throwing the bag at him and he turned it down smartly. So, um, but I still think that this rendition of K mag seems to be way more kumbaya amongst the team with like Gunther and Gene and like, I feel like they're happy with where they are and they're finally settling into like, being a fully funded, they're not like bringing it back to rich energy. They don't have any of that drama anymore. They've got like Chipotle and MoneyGram. They've got real sponsors now, and they're they're finally operating at the cost cap. I think, at least for Haas, I think they're in a good spot. They're happy with their drivers being like, you know, having that off race where they're flying, which we saw last race, like we talked about it. They were both putting up super quick times in qualifying the race pace is still shit, but I think it'll come around with some more development and having the money to do more development and not being like, Oh, you know, you don't get a new front wing this race because we can't afford it kind of thing. Um, and one last thing, uh, I forgot that they had Chipotle as a sponsor. I would like to pay unlimited amounts of money to have Gene, uh, Gene Haas, although that would be funny too. Gunter Steiner eating three double meat burritos from Chipotle and then just <laughs> taping the gurgling of his stomach after the fact. <laughs> <laughs> While in a tiny car. Yeah, I tiny mean, that goes without saying. With, yeah, with Matia. Yeah. <laughs> Team principals in tiny cars getting burritos. 
Yes, exactly. They wouldn't get sued by Jerry Seinfeld at all. No, that's all part of the Netflix <clears throat> umbrella. Yep. Hell, hell, throw Jerry into the car, too. Let's make it a total clown show. God, could you imagine the conversation between Jerry Seinfeld and Gunther? I'd pay for, I'd pay for, to see that, to be honest. Yeah. Okay. Yes. 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 That's like, that's who are you going to have at dinner, like, name five people? That would be an amazing, too, to add. Yeah. I feel yeah. like Gunther Steiner is the most underrated answer somebody could give me for that question because it always tends to skew political or celebrity. But give me Gunther Steiner. Yeah. Yep. I think out of all people in the Formula One grid, even dare I say more so than Danny Rick, I would rather have Gunther Steiner at, at dinner than Danny Rick. Anyway, we're way off base here. I mean, do. I I just gotta I just gotta go one step further on this off base thing. The thing that I don't like about the way formula teams think about drivers and and teams and all that stuff is like marketability. If you put Danny Rick and Gunther Steiner together on a team, like I don't know if you can get a more entertaining two people. Like we all collectively loved Pierre and Yuki. But like Gunther and Danny Rick it gives me lethal weapon energy in a sense or like that's the modern day lethal weapon where hell ricardo is riggs and uh murtaugh is played by gunter steiner because i want dan yeah. to get into comedic hijinks and i want gunter steiner to look at the camera and make a jim halpert face and say i'm getting too old for this shit <laughs> yes yes i mean i think that i think that you could actually crowdsource sponsorships with with people like that if you really were serious that's your spinoff for drive to survive just give them their own camera crew and just say you know what we'll film the rest of the paddock the rest of the grid your responsibility is just to focus on one team because that's how we truly (laughs) mark the success of a netflix show is the inevitable spinoff it breaks out i agree so uh drivers losing their seats going back to that um i think Zhou Guan Yu is solidly outperforming Botas this year. I mean, I don't know what Botas is doing as far as, you know, I develop- think Botas has basically adopted the late stage Kimi Raikkonen persona this year where he's just driving. If he gets any sort of momentum or positive reaction, great. I think he's just trying to count those laps down in his head. Yeah, yeah it does I- kind of seem that way. It does feel like he's a, a bit checked out or or he's just getting absolutely zero media coverage. Um, but like on, in his personal life, he's all into like biking now, like doing cycling races off road. Like he's even setting up. He, he just got his own signature bike, hey. which is pretty crazy. Uh, but he seems checked out. Um, I, I know he's still under contract, though. So that leaves us with who? Uh, I I think Sergeant, unless he really changes, turns it around, we're gonna lose the one American driver on the grid. Yeah, I think so. And I get, we'll give you a name, but I don't think it'll happen because I think he has Sal- Salber ties. But Teal Porcher, he was heavily rumored when the uh, Audi announcement came in that he's got links to Salber and and things like that, but. He's been performing at a high level in F2 uh, for many years. I think like since he was 16, and I think he's now 18 or 19. Um, but I think if there's anybody that's an, a win, not an if, it's it's him for the next seat in F1. Maybe on a rental to, to Williams, but. I have a question for you, Todd. I'm not 100% sure how this works, but like, for instance, I know that the F the, the Red Bull F2 group, right? There's like six or eight of them. Or there's a bunch of dudes that are on Red Bull junior team, right? One of them is an American guy, American uh, driver from North Carolina, which obviously would be closely tied to Haas um, since they're based in, I think North Carolina too. Right. But uh, there's also like, I don't, I think it's is it Enzo Fittipaldi is on the, Red Bull, t- one of the one of the young Fittipaldi's is on the Red Bull Junior team. Drivers like that, are they required to stick with Red Bull? Do they have to be bought out by other teams? Like, how would that how would that work? Like, let's say, you know, 
let's say the world is coming to an end and Haas is like, we're going to blow it all up and we're going to go find two really young drivers and we want these two guys from Red Bull. Do they have to like sign some of some sort of agreement with Red Bull or is that just like, I, I don't even know how that works. Do you? Yeah. So the, the, it's actually funny you mentioned that because that was a, a large part of Alpine's big stink when they lost lost uh, Oscar Piastri last year. They made like a, oh, this is going to make us re-examine how we're supporting young drivers, yada, yada, yada. Um, but as far as the Red Bull camp is concerned, they definitely are signed to a contract with Red Bull. So if Haas or any team wanted to come in, they would have to get the approval of uh, Red Bull to, to take that driver or which we've seen a lot more in recent years, they um, get them kind of on a loan. Like Albon is still technically under a Red Bull contract on loan from Red Bull to Williams. He, that's why you still see him with a Red Bull logo on his helmet. Got it. Like okay. he's still uh, in the Red Bull camp kind of, even though he signed like a two-year deal with Williams. Um, I think they're just kind of keeping a leash on him just because – um, but th- I would assume that if they've flat out released Fittipaldi or whoever that was in the Red Bull camp, there would be some money changing hands unless they just didn't care about the driver. Interesting thing to think about, because like I don't think maybe maybe that is something we get more into in a future episode. Like, I definitely haven't followed like all the drivers that came up. I mean, I know a lot of Red Bull makes a big stink about it. Right. It's like Max is homegrown and. Check goes home. You know what I mean? Like, but like outside of that, I know George and, and Mercedes had relationships way well before this season. Um, but it'd be interesting to kind of take a look at that and share that because that definitely also plays into like how we would start to think about predicting who's going where and, and who's on really on the hot seat. Right. Because if, if there's a scenario in which a driver, let's say, uh, since you mentioned Albon, let's say that Williams is paying extra for some reason to Red Bull in order to have Albon drive, then strictly from a business perspective, you have to think that they are going to take that into consideration when they go to other drivers, because if they don't have to pay another team for their driver, they're probably going to be like more likely to move to another driver. Right. At least that's my assumption. Yeah, I, I I think like I don't know. They have an established talent there with Albon. Like they know what they're gonna get out of him. He'll perform at a high level. He doesn't really have to perform under pressure in the Williams car, at least not currently. But I think um if they did take a big leap forward, I think he'd be a solid solid driver for him. Um but I it's like as we've learned in the last couple of years, contracts in Formula One mean kind of nothing. Yeah. So <laughs> it, we'll we'll see we'll see where it pay, plays out. But back to what Rose said, like there's not um you know a general generational talent in this crop of F two drivers. There's some very good drivers, but I don't think um there's any like you know. You know, George's, Lando's, who's the uh, Oscar Piastri's, like everyone that's super highly touted. So we'll see. Also, very ironic that Alpine made the stink about all the BS that happened at the end of last season in terms of contracts. And they're the team that came out the best out of all of them. Right. Like they're like unquestionably like what? Fifth team, right? Mercedes, Red Bull. Yeah. It's crazy. But I mean, I think it just speaks to who they are. They're a professionally boring team, even more boring than Mercedes because Mercedes will get you the occasional podium, but it's a nice life to have. But the thing I kind of wanted to segue into now is we've talked a little about Alpine. There is a video game that is coming out that not only features Alpine, but all the other nine teams on the paddock, and that is EA Sports F123. And there was the video that I think came out this day today, in fact, around certain drivers receiving and more importantly, trying to gauge the ratings of their closest competitor or closest friend on the paddock. 
And what I kind of did while these two guys were waxing poetic, I just made a list of the top five in each of the categories. Now, just to give you additional context, when we get these series of rankings for this video game, drivers, all 20 of them are measured across the following five categories, experience, racecraft, awareness, pace, and then just an overall. And to just provide context for each one of those, experience is what we think it is. This is based on the number of race starts a driver has had over the course of their career. Racecraft is the driver's ability to work through their way through the pack and finish in a higher position than where they started. Awareness, the less time spent in the steward's room would help drivers here. And then lastly, pace, which is benefits those who get closest to the fastest qualifying in race tap, race lap times. So that being said, guys, what do we make of these charts? Because there are some interesting things when you slice and dice these around those individual categories themselves. I got to start here because this you teed it up perfectly. And I'm That's guessing you guys haven't looked at the list too in depth. But I play this game every year when it comes out. I'm a nerdy sim racer. Um, I've got a whole sim setup right here that you guys can't see. Someday I'll do it from the sim setup. We'll do a podcast. Um, yes. But every driver is, they, they rate every driver out of 100 on these scales. The lowest rated driver for awareness is a 74. It is not Lance Stroll. It's your boy, bro, Zhou Guan Yu. What wow. awareness? Uh, what awareness rating do you think Lance Stroll got? I'm gonna go with 80, even though I know what the answer is. But you know, sometimes you gotta lie to the listener. <laughs> <laughs> now, are are these ratings from the other drivers? Is that what we're saying? No, so, no, no, no. This, this is, is from, from the, the game developers. This is the game itself. Okay, so two separate things, right? The video was other drivers trying to yeah. guess the ratings across those four to five categories. And I think somebody that was conspicuous in his absence was Lance Stroll in that video. And I wonder why that could be. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I can't I can't even get up to 80. I would say like maybe 76. You guys are both right, right there. He got a 78. Uh, how? How is he not <laughs> the lowest rated driver on awareness? I mean, you've got Logan Sargent, you've got Nick DeVries, yeah. you've got Yuki. He has benefited from so many new drivers on the grid this year and so many inexperienced drivers because the Zhou Guan Yu of it all, even something with the likes of Yuki, it's Lance's, dare I say, a seasoned driver. It doesn't necessarily mean, but then that goes more to the experience side of things. But yeah, like I said, I don't know what I was going to do to you guys was just read you the top five or six because there were some ties in each one of the categories. Some of these are fairly self-explanatory. Like if we go through experience, Fernando Alonso is 99, Lewis Hamilton is 97, Sergio Perez is 91, Valtteri Bottas, 88, Nico Hulkenberg, 86. Now, the only qualms I have is could there only be one person that gets 99? Because I think Hamilton is as close to deserving a 99 as anybody I can think of. But what do you guys make of just the experience top five? I think that's a great point. I, I would I would say that Lewis has to be. To me, it seems like he's got to be right there with Fernando, right? It, it was a bit surprising that like if they're going to give Alonso the highest experience rating, which fits, right? He's done the most Grand Prix on the grid, on the current grid. But like Lewis has also been in Formula One since 2008. Six, seven, okay. Yeah. Eight, I think. Um, Why is he not a 98? Like a 97 feels a bit disrespectful, no? Like, (laughs) I I mean, it's, it's two points, I know, but like, it's as disrespectful he, as the 97 as I've ever seen in video game stats, which clearly doesn't mean <laughs> anything in the grand scheme of things. But just bump him up to a 99. Like, he is the greatest driver of his generation. The eight titles tell you that. Or, I'm sorry, the seven titles. Asterisk. Seven? Thank okay, you. So, so that's actually, I think, I think you made the point for the argument for the 97, though, because Alonzo has driven from, from teams anywhere up and down the grid and been... Alonzo Lewis hasn't 
He hasn't started losing since last season, right? He's like only he's, driven for two teams. He's driven so. from the front so, for a very so long time. So having one losing season costs you two points of experience per EA. <laughs> No, and I mean, no, I would say like I would say like one point, right? Like I think Alonzo gets gets ninety nine because he is definitely the most experienced, has the most F one starts. Lewis loses one point for having slightly less number of starts, and one point for the lack of challenges that he's faced in the last ten years. Right, last year excluded from that. But I think that's also interesting. Like I would, love, I've never played this game. I'm not a video game person per se, but I'd be curious to see what they gave Max for awareness two, three years ago when he was like, you know, bullet train into the corner every corner, no matter who was next to him, right? Because that's like that's like the young driver inexperience slash aggressiveness that makes you a great driver in the future. But I think that like Lewis had that when he was young. Seb had that when he was young. Max had it for her, his first couple of years. And it's also the thing that we don't see from these up and coming drivers, right? Like they're not the type that are just going to push it to the limit and like force somebody to, to move on their behalf. Well, they also don't have cars to do that. But I, I don't know. That's really interesting. You know, it's funny that you mentioned that because Max Verstappen is the highest rated driver overall among the averages, his pace. 95 his racecraft 97 experience 84 which i thought maybe a touch low but his awareness is 85 still <laughs> so which let's use it uh-huh no i'm just I, I just find that funny that almost like the game developers haven't forgotten where max was a short time ago and if he was in a more Let's say if he wasn't in a car that was a second a lap faster than everybody else and he was in traffic a little bit, maybe we'd have a little bumps and bruises along the way. I, I was just going to say, I wouldn't I wouldn't have expected to side with the game developers as somebody who doesn't really play video games that much. But it is interesting, like if you move away from the experience column on the on the chart, Lewis and, and Alonzo are tied for second place, right? And I do think that is pretty accurate. Do you guys? Yeah. I mean, I feel like that's fair. It, if you give them equal machinery, that like if there's ever a race that I would want to see, it's Lewis now and Alonso now in equal machinery. Yeah. That, that would be is, amazing. That is secretly my one hope I have for the rest of this year is we get at least one race where it's those two just going at it, hammer and tongs for a podium or dare I say first place. Do you guys want to move to racecraft next since we kind of alluded to it? And if we do, the top five there is Max Verstappen at 97, Lewis Hamilton at 94, Sergio Perez at 93, and then a three-way tie between Carlos Sainz, Charles Leclerc, and Esteban Ocon all at 92. Does anything stick out for you in that top five or top six or anyone else in the grid with regards to racecraft as their rating? Alonso, that's a disrespectful number. If there's yeah, anybody we- on the grid that is craftier in a race car, more crafty than Alonso in a race car, like, I, I just can't believe that, that he's, he's that low. Or like, he's no, not. No, go ahead. Like, are you kidding me? He has less racecraft than Esteban Ocon. That's my favorite thing of this all, because I would just love to be the fly in the wall about when Fernando Alonso reads this list and is like, Ocon, really? That guy? Because that man has been the bane of his existence for the last two to three years, depending on how long we want to examine the relationship. I agree. I think Sergio Perez has essentially Fernando Alonso's, Alonso spot, and then everybody else can drop a point down. I have no issues. In fact, I'm flattered that they have Esteban Ocon on the same level as the rest of this list because everyone else is. Well, no, I think Carlos Sainz is only won one race as well. But this is, to me, a very impressive list to be a part of. And yeah, the Fernando Alonso thing is the one that's baffling. Not only that, Lando Norris, also a similar 91. As is your boy, Lance Stroll. So talk to me about racecraft again 
uh, Mr. Yates, because this truly seems to be the sweet spot for you to have one of your all time rants. <laughs> I just, I mean, yeah, he overtakes people all the time. So he's got racecraft. It, it, he pushes them out of the way, typically, and then has to go change his front wing. But he overtakes people a lot. So, yeah. Uh, yep. Totally, totally fine with a 91 in racecraft. But let's not forget. Let's go back to Alonzo for a second. This is the rant that I have. Because let's not forget that the only race win that SD Bestie has in his career is because of the absolute clinic of defense that Alonso put on on Hamilton in what was it Turkey? Yeah. 2 years ago? Like Exactly. That's I bet I, if I was Alonso I'd be pacing in my room. Like how the I can't believe that. Like Lance Stroll's going to get off easy on this because I'm just pissed about <laughs> Alonso's racecraft being less than Esteban Ocon. I, listen, it's racecraft and not defense, because we all know if it was defense, Alonzo would have gotten a 99 and then still complained about the one point that wasn't given to him. But it, but here's the real, like, the real thing, the underlying thing that I think is, like, just igniting Todd's fire right now. The definition of racecraft, right? Like you said, the driver's ability to work their way through the pack and finish in a higher position than when they started. If you asked anybody here... Who are you taking? Cars aside, don't talk about how Red Bull is like 10 times faster than everyone. Who are you taking? There is no hesitation for me. I'm going with Alonzo. Like, 100% I'm going with Alonzo. Like, I love Lewis. I love Checo. N- Norris, yeah, he's he, maybe someday he can be up there. But I'm picking Fernando Alonso because he's proven that he can do that year in, year out with terrible cars. Like, his name has been in, you know the sphere of formula one for so long with cars that he shouldn't have. Nobody talks about like drivers that finished 15th, 16th and 17th, unless they're on a podcast about formula one, the rest of the world doesn't care about those drivers. They don't even know those drivers, but for a long time, he's been in cars up and down the grid where he's, he's yeah. I I don't, I don't want to like get as excited as Todd, but I feel exactly the same way. You just did. You just did. (laughs) And I, I appreciate you. Coming up to my level there, because that's just. You know what? I will say this. Both of you showed an awareness and an appreciation for the great racing that you guys have seen in your life. And if that was as forced of a segue as I felt saying it out loud, you were absolutely correct, listener, because the next category we're going to look at is awareness. And with that one, I this is where I'm a little, dare I say, gobsmacked, because number one, and I don't think I would have gotten this guess if you'd given me 19 guesses. Valtteri Bottas with a 97 on awareness, followed by Lewis Hamilton with 94, Sergio Perez with 86, Max Verstappen at 85, Charles Leclerc at 85, and Kevin Magnussen at 85. I'm not saying Valtteri Bottas has no awareness. He has great awareness. But to be head and shoulders above the entire grid, I don't think I could come up with one stat that Valtteri Bottas is that great at over everyone else. Talk to me about this, guys. Like, What am I missing here? I can re- rebuttal that. Don't you he dare is, bring up that peach of an ass. <laughs> <laughs> he's aware he's got cake, first off. No, he is the most aware of a driver to ever play second fiddle to a world champion on the grid that's ever been. But if we that go joke back didn't to land the definition at all. of where we got this, the less time spent in the stewards room will help drivers here. That doesn't make any sense to me. So what I'm going to do while you guys talk – talk about this particular subject. I'm going to go to the official Formula One video because I think they might have a slightly better definition. See you guys in two minutes. <laughs> I, I mean, I think that's where Valtteri probably stands out, right? I He's not combative. He probably doesn't have too many penalties. He's pretty consistently, like, finishing without too much drama. Like, if awareness means, like, just getting through races and not fucking up and not running into people... Honestly, like he probably is like the most consistent. Yeah, like no, uh, with the exception of God, is that that same Turkey race that SD Bestie won when Valtteri bowling balled like the top five drivers? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That race aside, he it's a I big agree. race. 
<laughs> I agree with you, Nick, that he doesn't get crashed into a lot. So he's not putting himself in bad places. Right. And he doesn't necessarily crash into folks very often that race aside again. Um, and he doesn't like really gain a ton, but he also doesn't really lose a ton. Right. He knows where he is in the race, if that makes sense. Yep. Um, and I found the definition and it kind of makes sense with what we had heard from the other source Essentially, per Formula One's official website and YouTube page, awareness is a measure of the driver's ability to avoid incidents and penalties in the race. It drops the more frequently a penalty is likely to occur. More frequently. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I don't think he has too many penalties. Like, just, but maybe I, I mean I think early days of of you know racing with Lewis, he probably did. He was a little more aggressive, but I think he kind of settled into that second seat there comfortably and has maintained a very like kind of, yeah, as long as I survive and I can uh, ride my bike at the end of the race, then I'll be good. I still, I agree with you though. It is high. Like it's weirdly high that the only other driver in the nineties, I believe is Lewis Hamilton. And I think Lewis to me is more likely to get the 97. But then if I look at the rest of the top five or top six in this case, Sergio Perez, I feel like Lewis should be a 97. Sergio Perez to me is a 94. Max Verstappen, 85. I think he can be a tad bit higher. These next two to me are baffling. The same way Valtteri Bottas at 97 is. Charles Leclerc is at 85. Kevin Magnussen is at 85. Mm. They have incidents associated with them. That's all I'm going to say. Yeah, that is... Uh... They have racing incidents, but I wouldn't say necessarily penalty, like penalty no, deserving suck. incidents. Suck my balls. That's all out. <laughs> 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 oh, shit. Um, A measure of the driver's ability to avoid incidents and penalties in the race. They avoid <laughs> incidents, but they still take penal- penalties on, especially poor Charles. We missed a great opportunity, though, because after you said suck my balls, one of us should have said and on to pace, moving up, (laughs) taking the pace to the next level. Yeah, that's what I do. There's a reason why my nickname is the microwave. I just escalate in 30 (laughs) seconds. But thank you for that, Nick. Let's just go through pace because that's the last category. And I think this one feels still a little bit better baked than some of the other categories we've just kind of gone through. Max Verstappen has a 95 at pace. Fernando Alonso is at 93, George Russell at 91, Lando Norris at 91, Lewis Hamilton at 90, Charles Leclerc at 90. Where we want to start here. Is this stuff based on last season or is this stuff based on a combination of last season and this season? I feel it's a combination of last season and overall history. Yeah, I I would say it's, it's more recent history than... Like it, it, I don't think it's just based on this season currently, but like pace no. wise, obviously like M- Max is in the fastest car and he's driving out of his mind. He's going to be the highest. So like that makes sense. True. But if we are leveraging the component that 99 is the possibility, what else does Max Verstappen have to do to get a 99? Because I think this is as dominant of a era as we've seen a driver have in his two championship winning seasons. So it's, Pace benefits those who get closest to the fastest qualifying and race lap times. A driver beating their teammate is also taken into consideration. I feel like that's maybe where like Lewis falls down a little bit because he's finally got an equal teammate. Like George is fast, right? He's he's outpacing him in qualifying and in the race occasionally. So that's maybe where he could fall down a little bit. Like the fact that Alonzo is not a 99 compared to his teammate, like. No, but then where is Checo Perez? Because, okay, I acknowledge the fact that Max is kicking his ass more often than not, but he's still the second fastest driver in terms of overall pace. Is he not? Or am I misunderstanding this category? Well, I think, well, he's getting soundly beaten by Max. So absolutely. That's also the interesting part about it to your point, right? Because like, if you look at the list, Yuki Sonoda has an 87, which is the same as Checo. That means Yuki is has a better pace than Botas, Albon, uh, you know, Ocon. Like 
It's just that doesn't make any sense whatsoever, right? Yeah, I mean, that's a fair argument. But like I said, the definitions that I have here on that article that I sent, it's including their qualifying times and race lap times and whether or not you're beating your teammate, which if you look at race pace, like Checo is is pretty far off max, like anywhere from three to six tenths. Yeah, I mean, and th- th- I guess that also not only is Checo off of Max's pace, but Yuki is exponentially faster. So maybe he gets bonus points and gets up there. I also think that it's really interesting that, like, to think about how these types of things are done because, you know, we, we talk about, I think you mentioned like the top five row it, but like the reality is the top five is actually like a top six, seven with all these tied scores. And then, like, the second, you know, like, the fifth or sixth place is, like, Perez, Sainz, Yuki, uh, who, and then right after that is Esteban, Valtteri. You know, it's, like, they're all very tight. Like, instead of them saying, here's the 20 drivers and they're separated by 20 points, they definitely were, like, well, let's just keep them bunched together, you know? Like, we want to keep them. It's, we wanna, it's we want the racing to be fun. in terms of Yeah, ranking. exactly. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> that's that's funny well i hope somehow some way you guys end up playing this game at some point hey ea sports give us free copies we just spent like 45 minutes on this and thank you for the content but come on hook your boys up at least me because yeah, i de- yeah. i don't have to pay for it again also uh julie wood i know you're in the video game industry Maybe you have ties at EA. If you can somehow find out who came up with these driver ratings, we want them on the podcast. We just want to talk. <laughs> we just <wanna> talk. <laughs> oh, man. Okay. I think the last piece of news before we wrap this episode up, if I'm not mistaken, I'm going to skip over the, uh, the net zero targets that are air quotes here for the listeners. We're progressively moving towards this in Formula One. Because I think collectively we all believe that that's BS and we're not really doing anything. The real news is Daniel Ricardo and Will Arnett hosting. Like, I, I don't even know how to like express how excited I am to have them broadcast a race for races. Like, it's going to be ridiculous. Are they doing like color commentary during the race, or are they doing a show about the race? I saw the announcement, but I didn't really. uh... Here's what we have. ESPN is bringing a new additional viewing option to its coverage of three Formula One races this season with an alternate telecast that will complement the event's traditional production. The host of the new telecast will be Formula One driver Daniel Ricciardo, one of the sport's most popular and charismatic drivers, and actor-comedian Will Arnett, a tremendous fan of the sport who previously hosted a Formula One-centric podcast. The grandstand with Danny Rick and Will Arnett will debut for the June 18th Formula One Pirelli Canadian Grand Prix airing on ESPN2 beginning at 1.55 p.m. Eastern, while the traditional race will still be on ABC coverage beginning at 12.30 p.m. The other two editions will be the United States Grand Prix in Austin, Texas on October 22nd, hey, my birthday, and the inaugural Las Vegas Grand Prix on November 18th. Produced by ESPN in collaboration with Peyton Manning's Omaha Productions, the telecast will follow the success of the innovative and critically acclaimed Emmy Award-winning Monday Night Football with Peyton and Eli alternate telecast that debuted in 2021. Uh, Yada, yada, yada. Here's a comment from some bigwigs. Oh, here we go. Here's Danny Rick's quote, which is probably the most Danny Rick thing I'm going to say this podcast. This is going to be a hoot. As you'd expect, Will and I are going to be having some fun with the show, but we're hoping it feels like you're watching F1 with your mates. We will have some amazing guests, plenty of laughs, and with some luck, bring fans another step closer to the sport I love so much. Buckle up, America. Can we just call our episode Buckle Up, America? <laughs> yep, definitely. Thanks, Danny Rick. Come on the pod anytime you're ready. Yep. <clears throat> it's exactly what we think, which is a Manning cast, and I think that's going to be fun because you need entertaining and charismatic people, especially this year where the races have become a little bit more predictable and a little more boring. So I'm intrigued to see what they have. Will Arnett is one of the funniest people to me if for no other reason, just the sound of his voice alone. So yeah, I'm looking forward to this. Yeah, me too. I'm really not. I hope this sucks bad 
Because if this is good, Danny Rick's never going to drive again. I know, I know, Iron Trev, I can hear him screaming from Canada. He's probably not going to drive again. But I still hold out a little sliver of hope that somehow he gets back in F1 in a like, at least decently competitive car. But it, I like Will Arnett, and obviously I have maybe somewhat sexual feelings for Daniel Ricciardo. He <laughs> here to judge. He is like, like just oozes charisma. So he's probably going to be good at this. But somehow, I, I have listened to tidbits of the Will Arnett F1 pa- podcast, and it's not great. Like I know he's a somewhat new fan, but I, I just uh, I'm not a huge fan of like maybe how they produce that podcast or something. But I do like Will Arnett in all the things I've seen him on in TV and whatnot. So. It's probably going to be good. I hope that it's just too disjointed where it's not fun to like watch the race and hear them go on about whatever the hell. I don't know. This is my baby rant to go along with your adult full size man rant. I think the same issue that happened with him at McLaren is going to happen on this cast in terms of they're both going to be funny. They're both going to try to get the last laugh. And I think one thing you desperately need in that booth is a straight person or a straight man, a play by play guy that is completely boring and knows how to run a show. Because I am worried if it's just the two of them, I think it's going to devoid go down into a void of chaos, much like this episode is. But then again, we're not representing a large multinational corporation. We're just representing Nick Engvall's hopes and dreams. (laughs) Well, I don't know what to say to that, but. Honestly, like I, I understand exactly what you're saying, Todd and Rowett, but maybe the maybe the glimmer of hope that we can all look at and read deeply into is that they're just going to have a hoot and buckle up, America, and that's like a teaser for Danny Rick signing with Haas next season. <laughs> Todd, if I could change your mind and say instead of a Danny Rick led mega cast. What if it was a Gunter Steiner podcast, uh, mega cast instead? I don't know. That that's a different. Like I love Gunther reacting to what happens in the paddock in the race. I don't know if he would be. Well, actually, I know I take that back because the whole my boat thing when they were in Drive to Survive when they were taking promo picks for whatever that company was. That was like one of the best moments in Drive to Survive. So he would be funny regardless. Um, I don't think he'd be as good as Danny Rick, but it's basically what what, what you're saying is like these feelings for Danny Rick are much deeper than just his actions in the last two weeks signing this deal. What you really wish is that Danny Rick would have recommitted to racing or said he was done and retired that way you and your emotions wouldn't be on this swinging pendulum of where Danny Rick goes next. Right. Yes. Well put like, I I know. I mean, I don't want the, the, the second news that you said, right. That he's just like, all right, I'm going to be a celebrity now. I'd rather him go to another racing series or whatever, anything. uh, Cause I think he's still got it in him, but. But I also do think that this, pivot to broadcast journalism if we want to call it that that's entirely down to how popular the sport is if this sport is not as popular as it is now in america i don't think they go after danny rick and i think danny rick continues to stay the course if you will and see if he can grind out one more year as a reserve driver before inevitably taking someone's spot and more importantly it's almost a page out of the john gruden playbook where if he can teach us about this sport And he becomes the voice of this sport in this country. Inevitably, whenever he does decide to make another run at it, because I'm in agreement with the both of you that he is going to try to make a run at it. It's going to serve him when he has an entire nation backing him, so to speak, and saying, why not give Danny Rick a shot? So it's it's a genius move. Yeah. John Gruden with significantly less racism, which is always a plus. Anytime you can say the word significantly less racist, (laughs) doesn't matter who it is. If you are the same thing as the version you're being compared to, but you're the significantly less racist one. I'm all for you. Shouldn't have to be a qualifier, but I guess it is. 
<laughs> we are champions of diversity, if nothing else here at Exhaust Notes. We sure are. Curry in a hurry, coming soon. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, I couldn't hold that one back. Hey, honestly, this is—I think this is a great place to wrap up. Just me and my mates talking about <laughs> curry. And- <laughs> All right, well, another episode in the books, guys. Any any parting parting words before we get out of here? Uh oh, Canada. <laughs> oh, here, let's do this. Let's end on our predictions. What do we have as podiums? Nick, start us off. I think Lewis is going to be top three. I think Max is probably going to win. And I think Alonzo is. I'm going to go Max, Max Lewis and Alonzo. Todd? I'm going to go wild card. I don't know why I feel like this. But Max wins. Alonzo P2. Chuck LeClaire P3. Ooh. I'm going to go for the rare Uh, Maxless podium, even though it's never going to happen. Uh, Give me Fernando one. Carlos two, Checo three. Wow. All right. All right. We'll see. We'll forget again on our next podcast and then think yeah, about somebody it. Somebody got that podium right and it's driving me up the wall to see I, who it was. I totally think you're right about that. And I, I didn't listen back to see if anybody got it. Listeners, to the person that tells us who it was that predicted that podium, you have my utmost respect and my attempt to say the word predicted correctly. So there you go. Hey, how about this? We can sweeten the pot. We'll send you an exhaust notes t-shirt. If you can tell us. I don't even who actually that. said that. Do you exactly. That? I don't. Yeah. It's in the works. It's in the works. I didn't want to tell everybody and, and like then we have to, stuck to. Like, and write us reviews, you clowns. <laughs> <laughs> but we can definitely do that. We can make that happen. So. All right, guys, how can they find you outside of the show? Uh, you can find me on Instagram at Rohidum13, Twitter, Rohizi, uh, OnlyFans. Only if you write me 100 reviews. The ball's in your court, listener. Oh, God, please write reviews. I'm going to go write another one. Um, I'm on uh, Instagram at dadshoe.jpeg. That's S-H-U-E. Oh, slightly regretting doing that for my username. Also on Twitter at dadshoe underscore F1. I think you're actually dad shoe underscore JPEG on Twitter. too. <laughs> something like that. If they we search dad shoe that. with a S H U E, which is shout out Michael Schumacher. And if you're listening to F1, you get it. Um, yeah. They'll find me. It'll be linked in the description. Whether you're watching or listening, you can find us on the other platforms. You can find me at Nick Engvall everywhere. Most importantly, hit the first link in the description and join the community in the discord. Uh, watch the race with us this weekend. And yeah, we appreciate you listening. We'll catch you on the next episode. Peace.